is uh, an appendix that says uh, four proofs that Scripture approves of substantive doctrinal equivalence and does not require verbatim identicality of wording in preservation. Okay, so we're going to be kind of going back and forth between these two things. The reason I did it this way is so that you could have a handy reference here um, to some of the things that I was going to want to be uh, mentioning or uh, referencing. So if you grab the Lesson 74 uh, portion first, if you grab that portion first, it says, in, le uh, in Lessons 70 through 72, we considered fundamental aspects of transmission by looking at the importance of presuppositions and how they impact one's approach to textual criticism. With that accomplished, last week in Lesson 73, we embarked on a discussion of other basic matters related to the topic before laying out some principles for discerning, locating, or identifying the preserved text in history it was deemed prudent to consider the following basic points regarding transmission. So we looked at, number one, materials used in transmission. We looked at witnesses to the New Testament text. We did both of those last Sunday. We looked at the papyri. We looked at the two different, uh, the, the uppercase Greek manuscripts, the lowercase Greek manuscripts. We mentioned some things about the early translations and then also the lectionaries. So, that, so then we also are going to be looking at false assumptions concerning transmission and scribal errors and corruption, okay? So in Lesson 73, we considered the first two points, materials uh, used in transmission, and number two, witnesses to the New Testament text. Today in Lesson 74, we want to consider point three, false assumptions concerning transmission. In doing so, we will consider the following subpoints: Number one, transmission and the telephone game illustration. And number two, the idea that transmission requires verbatim identicality of wording. So I want to move through this kind of fast here, especially this first point, because I want to spend the most of my time on the second point, okay? So when it comes to the topic of transmission, it is not uncommon to hear someone say something like the following, quote, It's impossible to know what the originals look like since the Bible has been copied thousands of times by so many different people. So you may have heard somebody say something along those lines. Or, put a different way, how can we know some 6,600 cop, uh, copies later that the scriptures have not been altered? So you might hear somebody say something along those lines as well, okay? So, transmission and the telephone game is the first sub-point that I want to talk about, okay? While these questions are natural, I believe they are based upon a false assumption, People wrongly assume that the transmission of the New Testament text is like the telephone game that they may have played as children. Dr. Jim Taylor discusses this illustration in his book, In Defense of the Textus Receptus, God's Preserved Word to Every Generation. He says, quote, One child would whisper something in the ear of another child. The message would get passed from child to child until the last child finally repeated out loud the message that he or she received. The game rarely ended with the same message that it started with. Now, how many of you ever did that as a kid? You play the telephone game, right? And then it was always who could come up with the most off-the-wall way of changing it so that it was nothing like the way it started, right? At least that's the way I, what I would do when I played, okay? So it would be a mistake to view the transmission of the Scriptures in this manner. First, the telephone game represents a strictly linear or one-to-one -one system of transmission. Okay, so I give, I whisper to Sylvia, Sylvia whispers to Mike, and so on. We come all the way out over here, over here to Andrew, and it's totally different than what I first said to Sylvia, right? That's, that message is transmitted in a one-to-one -one system, uh, and it's also being transmitted verbally or orally, not written down, okay? In the case of the scriptures, they, they were mass copied from multiple different sources, uh, in, the, in the case of the scripture, sorry, they were mass copied from multiple different sources. Consider the following illustration from the pen of Dr. Taylor. He says, quote, Imagine for a moment that the Apostle Paul has just sent a letter to your church in Ephesus. The messenger would arrive with the letter and it would be read to the church. The church, realizing that this letter was God's message and knowing that it must be passed on to other churches, would desire to have a copy of its own. So, someone... I believe, I believe one of the New Testament prophets, so that's my interjection, okay, would be given the task of making an exact copy of Paul's inspired letter. Then, either the copy or the original would be sent to the next church. I personally think they would have kept the original for themselves and sent the copies to the other assemblies, at least 
I think that makes more sense. In the next church, the process would be repeated. So then the next church, the Corinthians, let's say, for example, they get the, if, the Ephesians letter. And they are going to read it, and they're going to make a copy, and then they're going to spread those copies around, and the Word of God is going to be proliferated in this way. In the meantime, back in the first church, other copies would be made for distribution to anyone who wanted one. So one copy of a manuscript would become the source document for numerous others. So we don't just get a copy of a copy of a copy. We get numerous copies from a single document, okay? And then we also get numerous copies from a copy. So unlike the telephone game, we are afforded much more than one witness to the original message, right? So if you think about it like this, so if this is the original sent to Ephesus by Paul, the Ephesians are going to get that and they're going to make a copy to send somewhere else, right? But then are they going to make copies of that? Are they going to make only one copy or more than one? They're going to make more than one, right? So eventually, you, you can see how this is going to get proliferated as copies are being what? Copied. Copied and copied and copied and copied, right? And so you have a, and that's always better than an oral passed on tradition orally because you then always have a witness to what was being said, okay? So a second reason why the telephone game fails and is an illustration for transmission is found in the fact that it is an oral exercise as opposed to a written endeavor. While mistakes can be made in copying, okay, they can also be easily corrected in later copies. So can you realize you made a mistake and go back and fix it if you have it written down in front of you? Okay? Another problem with the telephone game was that the message was passed from child to child verbally, not, with, not so with the scriptures. In fact, the letters were copied. The copyists took great care to ensure the copies were accurate. Did they make mistakes? Yes, sometimes they did. Is it possible that a copyist or two decided to change the text? Yes, and we have evidence that that sort of thing happened from time to time. As a result, modern textual analysis have, uh, analysis have sought to classify the copies into families where each family is identified by some characteristics based upon the variants found in the manuscripts. Now, we talked about that last week, right? The Byzantine, Alexandrian, Western, all these so-called text types, that's what he's talking about there, okay? While it is true that there are many variants in the existing manuscripts, it is also true that the sheer volume of manuscripts makes it easy to determine where copyists made mistakes. So if I have a whole bunch of copies that agree with each other against one in one reading, I can weigh, I can pretty, I, I can determine by making uh, comparisons where the mistake may have occurred by, by looking at the, the totality of the copies and the evidence that's available, okay? Along with this very obvious fact that just as errors can be propagated from one text to another, <clears throat> we can safely assume that corrections could be made as well. Poor readings could be eliminated. Corruptions could, ha uh, could have been set aside. Deletions could have been added back into the text. Additions could have been removed. It is, now this is important, it is just as much an assumption that errors had to be propagated as it is to say errors had to be eliminated. In other words, you're, you're making an assumption either way you want to go with that. Okay? Thirdly, the telephone game analogy for transmission fails to consider God's promise to preserve his word. Taylor says, quote, usually a person will not vocally admit to doubting God's promises. And in some cases, if we were to ask them if they believe the Bible is completely true, they would agree. But then, as they approach the subject of manuscript evidence, they, uh, they begin, I think there's a word missing there, they begin to move from a faith-based approach, or from a faith approach to an approach based on human reasoning. Typically, it is simply an approach that does not consider the supernatural ability of God to providentially protect and guide the transmission of his exact message. So that, that, that's involved there, okay? Now, we've got 45 minutes left to get into the, the meat here of what I want to talk about. You'll notice there that Taylor said his exact message. One of the things that I have come to, what I'm going to teach you next is something that I have never read in any book on this topic. It's not something I've heard really anybody else explain in the way that I'm going to try to explain it. This is the understanding that I've come to as a result of looking at these things.
Those of you that have been a part of the class uh, for in previous segments of the class, this is not new, but it does relate to what we've been talking about in the issue of transmission. The second false assumption that I want to deal with is that transmission requires verbatim identicality of wording. Okay? Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language defines the word verbatim as follows. Word for word, in the same words, as to tell a story verbatim, another has related it. Okay? So, if I take this first copy of Appendix A, page 11, and I take this down to the photocopier in the office, and I set this thing in there, and I program it in for 100 copies, will I get 100 exactly identical copies to this page? Yes. I will. Now, did that technology exist in the first century when God inspired the New Testament? No. No. Okay. The technology that was available then was hand copying. Okay. Uh, similar to what we've uh, tried to chart out there. It was hand copying. It was, I'm going to copy this thing by hand, right? So verbatim, so the goal of this lesson is to show that the testimony of the scriptures does not require verbatim phraseology, simply equivalent meaning. Now, don't freak out. Listen to everything I'm going to say. It is possible to say the exact same thing using different words. Okay, number one, look at the example. At 3.30, I drove to the store. Number two, I drove to the store at half past three. Are those communicating the exact same substantive information? Yes, they, are. they are communicating the exact same substantive information without using identical what? Words. words. The words are in different order. The words are not identically the same, but are they still communicating substantively the same thing? So are they substantively equivalent to each other, even though they are not verbatimly identical? Yes. Is everybody with that? Okay, look at, the, look at the example. So consider the following example from 2 Timothy 2.15. The Geneva Bible says at the end of that verse, it says, dividing the word of truth aright. The King James says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Is that substantively communicating the exact same doctrinal content? Yeah. Yeah. Even though it is not using verbatimly identical what? Words. words. Okay? Is everybody with me so far? In both examples, the order of the words and the words themselves are different. But the substance is equivalent. This highlights an important point. There is a difference between, number one, a different way of saying the same thing, and number two, a substantive difference in what? Meaning. So if I drive to the, at 3.30 I drove to the store, or I drove to the store at half past three, is the substantive meaning of those statements exactly equivalent to each other? Mm -hmm. Yes, even though I'm not using the exact same what? Words. Words, okay? Now, look at the next point. It is imperative to remember that the promise of preservation does not demand that the Word of God be transmitted in a state of verbatim or exact identicality. Maybe add there Xeroxed identicality. Okay? During the manuscript period, stretching from the writing of the New Testament in the first century, Till the invention of the printing press by Johann Gutenberg in 1555, the transmission of the Word of God was done via handwritten copies. That God did not supernaturally overtake the hand of every scribe slash copyist during the manuscript period or every typesetter or compositor after the invention of the printing press to ensure that no differences of any kind entered the text is evident via a consideration of the extant historical evidence. Please recall the following facts from previous lessons, okay? Fact one. Fact one, top page four. The original autographs are not extant, i.e., they no longer exist. Do we still have that original that Paul sent to the churches? No, okay? That's a fact. Fact number two. No two Greek manuscripts, even the Byzantine manuscripts of the majority, are exactly the same. Mm 
Fact three, no two printed editions of the Greek New Testament are exactly the same, even Texas Receptus. Fact four, no two editions of the King James Bible are exactly the same. Fact five, the King James differs from modern versions. Fact six, no two modern versions read exactly the same. Okay? So consider the following summative statement from the pen of Kevin Bauder. He says, quote, If the preservation of the Word of God depends upon exact preservation of the words of the original documents, then the situation is dire. No two manuscripts contain <clears throat> exactly the same words. No two editions of the Masoretic text contain exactly the same words. No two editions of the Texas Receptus contain exactly the same words. No two modifications of the King James Version contain exactly the same words. And the Bible nowhere tells us which edition, if any, contains the exact words of the original. These are not speculations. These are plain facts. Okay, so let's just pause there for a minute. Anywhere you want to look in this conversation, are you going to be able to exact, are you going to be able to demand exact verbatim identicality of wording? No. Okay? So, given the biblical data, <clears throat> as well as the historical and textual facts, the following points are inescapable. Number one, God promised to preserve his word. Now, we're not going to look at all those verses again, but does the Bible teach the promise of preservation? Yes. yes. Okay? So, God, which, number one, God promised to preserve his word. Number two, God did not see fit to preserve his word by preserving the original autographs. Okay? This is self-evident because the original is no longer what? So if the way God was going to accomplish the promise of preservation was to preserve the original autographs, then would we have the original autographs? Yes. Number three, God did not supernaturally overtake the pen of every scribe, copyist, or typesetter who ever handled the text to ensure that no differences of any kind entered the text. How do we know that? Because differences exist at every what? At every level. Okay, so look at number four then. If the standard for preservation is plenary, pristine, verbatim, or exact identicality, why did God not just preserve the originals and remove all doubt? Imagine how much angst God could have saved the body of Christ in this matter if he intended for you to have it Xeroxed perfection in the copy for him to consider his word having been preserved. If that's what he intended to do, why did he not just preserve the originals and remove this entire discussion? Are you following that? But that he so did he promise to preserve? Yes. Okay. Do we have the original autographs? No. Do we have a tradition that has variant readings in it that are not exactly identical to each other? Yes, if God intended for you to have that type of exact identicality or verbatim identicality in preservation, then he could have saved us all the time and the trouble and just simply preserved the originals from the start so we wouldn't even need to be having this one discussion. But that's obviously not what he did. Yet he promised to what? Preserve his word. So that means, therefore, that he must have foreseen to do it a different way. Is everybody following that? Okay. The reason, I think, for this is that God wants people to walk by faith mm -hmm. in their biblical view of the text. Okay? So, historically, advocates of the traditional Greek text, i.e. the Texas Receptus and the King James Bible, have demanded that preservation slash transmission occurred with verbatim or exact identicality of wording as a method of refuting the claims of the critical text and modern version advocates. Given the fact that conservatives, the theologically conservative people, believe in plenary verbal inspiration or the inspiration of every word, 
it is reasonable to assume and perhaps expect that preservation would also be both verbal and plenary. It is therefore easy to see why preservationists have demanded identical, identical wording excuse me, as their standard for preservation. They view this conclusion as, lo as following logically from the doctrine of plenary verbal inspiration. So in other words, let me explain. If my view of inspiration is that God verbally inspired every single word, and I can see in my Bible that he also promised to preserve that which he inspired, you can see why people would take the jump then to say that he would have preserved it exactly the way he was. He wrote it, okay? But yet the facts are what we just looked at, right? So does that mean God didn't preserve his word? No. No. It just means we have to rethink a little bit about how that preservation was. Was done. How that preservation occurred, okay? So the next point. However, when one looks at the historical data, they encounter the fact that no two Greek manuscripts, even Byzantine, editions of the Textus Receptus or printings of the King James Bible are exactly identical. This is the source of concern for many, given their prior belief in and demand for verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation slash transmission. Let me just say, that was me. Before 2011, that was me. I was functioning under the assumption that preservation d demanded exact identicality of wording. That's the way I taught it in this assembly in 2009. That's the way I taught it in my previous assembly uh, before 2007. That was the understanding that I had in Bible college. And it was not until I was handed a book in 2011 by Brother Craig Holcomb called The Textual History of the King James Bible that I actually... And when I first saw... The reality of the, 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 the printed history of the King James text, not even looking at Greek, not even looking at any of that other stuff, but just the, the, the history of the printed text of the King James Bible, I realized right away that I had a problem and I was extremely upset. Rattled my cage. Okay, so look at the next sentence. Recall the following comment from the pen of Harry A. Sturz. In, a, in the Byzantine text type and New Testament textual criticism, he says, quote, One danger of such a position, that the faith of some has been weakened when they have become aware of variant readings in the manuscripts, precisely because they have confounded preservation with inspiration. Let me just say, that was me. That statement there was me in 2011. When I realized that the situation was not as I had assumed it was, it bothered me. And I had to sit there and think through what was really going on here. Okay? Is everybody with that? Mm -hmm. Running headfirst into the facts, one is forced to decide. Are they going to turn away from the doctrine of preservation in favor of rationalistic and naturalistic explanations of the facts, or look to the scriptures to inform their understanding on the nature of preservation. Now, think about that. What is it that taught me to believe in preservation in the first place? It's the Word of God. So now, so I believe in preservation. I don't believe that the Word of God is misleading me. I don't believe it's telling me something that's false. And so now I'm seeing this situation that is not lining up with the way that I thought it was beforehand, right? So what do I, what do, I do? Do I just say, well, God, do I, I have to make a choice, right? Do I continue to operate by faith, believing that the answer to my dilemma is right there within the Word of God itself? Or does that make me leave the, pre the preserved position and adopt the modern critical theory of reconstruction. Okay? Now, for many, they get to that point and they would leave the faith-based presuppositions of preservation, okay? And they would say, well, then I clearly have to go this other route. For me, I did, I looked at it differently, okay? And I'm just telling you my experience, okay? Look at the next point. The factual reality of variant readings and the transmission of God's word need not overthrow one's belief in the promise, in God's promise to preserve his word. It did not for the reformers, as we will see in future lessons. 
These facts need not lead one to deny slash doubt the clear promise of God. Rather, one can adopt a modified position on preservation based upon faith in God's written word. After studying the issue, I have come to believe that the presumption that preservation slash transmission occurred with verbatim identicality is the central problem in the entire textual slash Bible version debate. Think with me for a minute. Why is there an entire cluster of Christians that thinks they have to reconstruct the original? Because the original is the only thing without any what? Without any variation in it. Okay? So even those who are of the reconstructionist mindset and think that we need to go all the way back to reconstruct the original, something that I don't think is even possible, by the way, which I've made clear in previous lessons, they're doing that, and the reason they're doing that is because that's the only way they can wash their hands of the idea of variant readings. Okay? Is everybody following what I'm saying? In term two of this class... So that would have been lessons 28 through 56. We learned that demanding exact identicality of wording in the preservation slash transmission of the text is carrying the corollary between inspiration and preservation too far. No verse in the Bible makes such a demand. Okay, so think about that. What verse in the Bible tells somebody to reconstruct the original? There isn't one, right? What verse in the Bible teaches me to expect Xeroxed perfection in preservation? I don't think there is one, okay? But stay with me, okay? Four scriptural proofs were offered as evidence that preservation slash transmission need not have occurred with verbatim identicality. So we looked at, number one, the fact that the New Testament quotes of the Old Testament do not match verbatim. We looked at the fact that the Old Testament quotations of the Old Testament do not match verbatim. We looked at the fact that New Testament quotations of the New Testament do not match verbatim. And then we compared 2 Kings 19 with Isaiah 37 and saw that they do not match verbatim. And you'll see the next point there is for you to go to Appendix A. So if you'd pick up that other sheet. <clears throat> Let's just look at page 11. Just going to look at a few examples here to refresh your memory. Okay? So look at the chart on the bottom of page 11. This is, this is Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Okay? So I have, high, I have bolded all the words that are different between Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2 in your King James Bible, and Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Okay? So if you, if you look at that, you'll see that are those things saying the exact same thing? Are they saying, wait, hang on, let me rephrase. Are they using verbatim words? No. no. Does the thing in Luke even include an entire phrase in the recovering of the sight to the blind that isn't found in Isaiah 61 in your King James Bible? Mm -hmm. It's in brackets in the Luke column. Does everybody see that? Okay. Let's go to the top of the next page. Actually, you need to, um, hang on. Actually, grab your Bible just quickly and turn to Luke 4. You need to see what the Lord Jesus Christ says about that. So if you're watching this at home right now or after the fact on YouTube, you, should, you can get your Bible out and, and check these things. I'm going to be posting these notes uh, to the church website as well for you to follow along. But in Luke chapter 4, so the, the portion that's being quoted there is in, is in uh, Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19. Okay? So in verse 19 he says, To preach the acceptable year of the Lord, look at verse 20, And he closed the book. And gave it back to the minister, and gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. Now look at what the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse twenty-one. And he began to say unto them, "This day is this what?" Scripture. So hang on a minute. Does the Lord Jesus Christ call what he reads there Scripture? But it's not an exact verbatim identical match from Isaiah sixty-one. 
So if the Lord Jesus Christ can call that what? Scripture, and, and it's not verbatimly identical, even within my King James Bible, it's not a verbatim identical match, and he can call it Scripture, then that means I ought to be able to call it what? Scripture as well. Okay, look at the next one. Turn to, in the appendix, go to um, Acts, go to the next one on page 12, and in your Bible, just turn quickly if you would to Acts 8. So what I'm doing here is trying to refresh your memory about some of these things, and, hope, and and if you weren't here when we originally went through this, give you some food for thought and some resources to go through um, later on. Okay. So the manuscript so at the top of page twelve in your notes, the manuscript copy that Christ is reading from in Luke four is not an exact match with the King James text of Isaiah sixty one. Now let me just say I had a encounter with a very prominent, very very prominent. King James advocate over this Luke 4, Isaiah 61 issue, okay? And the solution that this brother gave was to say that, well, the passage there in Luke 4 doesn't really mean what it says. Jesus isn't reading from a manuscript copy. And the reason that was said was because he's, th th there's a desire to want to defend this idea that it has to be what? Exactly identical, right? And if I'm going to have to defend an idea that then puts me, con that, that, that puts me in having to argue contrary to what the text actually says, to me then that, that demonstrates that my demanding or my assumption that it has to be an exact identical match is the problem, not the text that I have in front of me. Is everybody following that? So you can compare here in Acts 8, 32 through 33, and in 33, um, the, the, there's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. Look with me at Acts quickly. Look at me at Acts 32. Now this is the situation with the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, and the place of the scripture which he read was this. So is the Ethiopian eunuch going back to Ethiopia with a copy of the book of Isaiah. Yes. 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 He's got the scripture in front of him, and the Holy Spirit says he's what? He's reading the manuscript copy that he has in front of him, right? Verse 32. So hang on. Does God the Holy Spirit in verse 32 call what this guy has in his chariot scripture? Yes. yes. So if you compare them, are they an exactly identical match? No. no. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which you read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. Now watch. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same what? Scripture. And preached unto him who? Jesus. So, are those an exactly verbatim identical match? No. But does God the Holy Spirit have any problem calling what he just read Scripture? He's no problem. Okay. So look at the notes, page 12, in, in Acts 8, 26 through 30, the Ethiopian eunuch is on his way home from Jerusalem in his chariot reading a manuscript copy of the book of Isaiah. When Philip is prompted by the angel of the Lord to join himself unto the eunuch's chariot, he finds, he finds him reading the above passage from Isaiah 53. When one compares the text of Acts chapter 8, verses 32 through 33 with Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8, the wording is far from identical. Okay, yet the doctrinal substance is unaltered despite not possessing what? Verbatim wording. Okay, Acts 8, 32 and 35, twice in this passage, the Holy Spirit calls, calls excuse me, the text of verses 33 and 30, 32 and 33, Scripture, despite the lack of verbatim wording, with Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8, in the King James Bible. Once again, this proves that demanding exact sameness in wording as the standard for preservation is overreaching. God the Holy Spirit does not even demand that level in his own word. Mm 
Is everybody with me? You guys, Stuarts, are you guys tracking with me? You're kind of new to this. I, just, I don't want to single you out or anything, but most of these other folks were, were here before. Are you, is this making sense to you? This is good. Okay, amen. So, for the sake of time, if you go to page 13 in the appendix, you just have more examples and further explanation. Um, come with me in that appendix. Go to page 16. So I want that first dark bullet at the top of page 16. So I'm skipping other examples for the sake of time. You have all of them right there in the notes there in the appendix. Okay? So page 16. So in the above examples... Which verse is right? The New Testament or the Old Testament passage? The answer is they're both what? Right. They're both right. From this, we can make the following observations. Number one, the New Testament quotations of the Old Testament are not verbatim and sometimes considerably different. Number two, the New Testament quotations specifically say it is written when those exact words are not in fact what? Written. Number three, this proves that the scripture considers the New Testament phrasing to be the equivalent of the Old Testament verse even though the words are not what? Verbatim. And for the fourth, it is thus possible for different phrasings to be equivalent and both be the word of God, even though they are not what? Verbatim. Verbatim. So what we're talking about here are different ways of saying what? Same. The same thing. Okay? There are different ways of saying the same thing and communicating the exact same substantive doctrinal content. Is everybody following that? Okay. That is a wholly different thing from talking about dynamic equivalency. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about substantive doctrinal equivalency and different ways of saying what? The same thing. Okay. So now let's go back to page five. So I do commend you. You need to, you need to look at the rest of that appendix and go back and look at original lesson 43. Based upon the textual facts observed in Lesson 43 and highlighted in the appendix, can you make a note to add that after that, Sylvia? Mm -hmm. uh, right there. So based upon the textual facts observed in Lesson 43, it would be wrong to require verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation. This standard cannot even be sustained within the King James text. Okay. Consequently, it is not helpful or productive for King James advocates to adopt a standard for preservation that cannot even be sustained in the very Bible they are asserting is perfect. Now, is everybody following what I just said? We are obviously not finishing all this. So, moreover, the definition of preservation, the definition of preservation does not demand verbatim identicality for something to be characterized as having been preserved. Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language defines preservation as follows. It defines it as, quote, the act of preserving or keeping safe the act of keeping from injury, destruction, or decay is the preservation of life or health, the preservation of buildings from fire or decay, the preservation of grain from insects, the preservation of fruit or plants. Now watch this last bit. When a thing is kept entirely from decay or nearly in its original state, we say... It is in a high state of what? 
So if God could keep the substantive doctrinal content of his Bible pure, even though the exact words are not available in the sense of them being Xerox photocopied identicality, we can still say that the word of God has been what? Preserved. Now, I'm making an argument here, again, I'm making an argument here, a, a specific, particular sort of argument about this that I've not read, read or heard anybody make quite the way I'm making it to you, mm -hmm. okay? And the reason I'm making it this way is for the following reasons. What this does is that, does, does this acknowledge the fact of variant readings? Yes. yes. But what it's also doing is saying, the, the fact that there's variant readings isn't the problem. The issue is what's the nature of those variant readings? And variant readings that differ substantively are the problem. Variant readings that are just different ways of saying the same thing, those aren't what? Those aren't problems at all. And it is only because someone is coming to the issue with the preconception that this had to be exactly identical and verbatim that, that it has caused this mess that we currently see among us in the body of Christ. Okay, So look at the next point. If the substantive doctrinal content of the Scripture is intact, we can say without any doubt that they have been what? Preserved. Preserved. Again, if the Holy Spirit can quote his own work without using exactly identical words and still call it scripture, then who are we to demand more from the doctrine of preservation than God Almighty? Okay? Now, it is only when one demands that preservation slash transmission requires the same precision as inspiration, verbatim identicality, that the corollary between inspiration and preservation runs into trouble. Lessons 42 through 45 were devoted to this point, okay? So um, I'm going to come over here and show you this chart that I created, and I'm, I'm going to adjust the camera just a little bit to follow. Now I'm also going to make this available online. It already is available online. So let's start up here in this corner. Okay? This asserts that the Bible, the Bible claims plenary verbal inspiration for itself. That God inspired what? Every word. Okay? The Bible also claims to be preserved. Bible's claim, preservation, promise of preservation is the Bible's claim for itself. And then I list out uh, a bunch of different verses that discuss that. Okay? So we start up here. So belief in the scripture leads one to maintain a belief in both inspiration and what? And preservation. So we start there, right? Then we follow this arrow down. Preservation is the corollary of inspiration. It is reasonable to conclude that preservation occurred with the same precision as inspiration, i.e., plenary verbal. But many mistakenly assume that this requires verbatim identicality. This false assumption underlines the entire textual uh, this this assumption underlines the entire textual variant discussion and leads to unscriptural conclusions. Is everyone with me so far? So this is this is my chart. So if it's bad, you need to tell me. Okay. So that leads me to a point where I need to exercise what? Caution, okay? Variant readings are a historical fact. We've already, done, we've, already, we've already talked about that. No two Greek manuscripts, even Byzantine, editions of the Texas Receptus, or printings of the King James are exactly the same. Okay? This leads to the realization that preservation did not occur with identical wording. Now, I still believe in preservation because the Bible up here asserts what? Preservation. So when I come down here and I encounter something, I'm like, hmm, what do I do about this? Okay, well, what are my options once I encounter this? My first option, option one, is the originals only position. This position confines inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy to the non-existent original autographs as a means of dealing with the varying readings. 
So I, can, I got this whole variant reading mess over here. The way I can deal with it is to just say, well, the original. I'm going to reconstruct the original where there are no variants, and I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to deal with the problem. Okay? Advocates for this position argue that their job is to reconstruct the biblical text. This position is non-scientific and non-falsifiable. Uh, in the absence of the original, how does one know whether they have accurately reconstructed the text? The position is of no practical consequence and cannot be maintained by faith in God's word. There's no verse of scripture that tells me this is what I should do. It is purely human reason and logic that lead me to adopt that viewpoint. Is everybody with me? Okay. That's a dead end. The second way of dealing with the textual, the historical facts. Option two, faith for faith's sake. This position pretends like the variant readings don't exist, don't exist, and insists upon plenary verbal preservation. Some incorrectly insist that God re-inspired his word in English between 1604 and 1611 as a means of producing a verbatim, as a means of providing the verbatim identicality of wording that this view of preservation demands. It has the correct starting point in that it believes in preservation. It's consistent with the fadistic believing approach, but it's carrying the corollary between inspiration and preservation too far. So I perceive that to be another what? Another dead end. Is everybody with me? Again, I know you're gonna, it's going to require some processing of what I'm saying. But there's a third option. And that's what I'm explaining or advocating for right now in this lesson. And the third option is to biblically amend one's view of preservation. Okay? The facts need not overthrow one's belief in the promise of preservation. And this is key. Rather, one should look back to the scriptures, which taught them to believe in preservation in the first place, to teach them how to think about varied readings. Okay? When one does this, they will conclude that the insistence upon the standard of verbatim identicality was excessive and an overstatement of what the scriptures teach about preservation. So when I get to this point, I, I don't go here to the originals only. I don't bury my head in the sand and pretend like there are no variants, even within the King James uh, printed history. What I do is I take a, an amended position. I look back to the scripture up here which taught me to believe in inspiration and preservation in the first place to then help me settle how I should view textual variants. Okay? So the result of all this is a biblically amended position on preservation. It drops from rate of identicality as a standard for preservation. And if one allows the King James Bible to teach them about the nature of preservation, they will conclude that demanding verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation was overreaching to begin with. Okay? And there are at least four scriptural proofs found within the King James Bible that support this conclusion. That's what I gave you in that appendix A, starting on page 11. How the Old Testament quotes the Old Testament. How the New Testament quotes the New Testament. How the New Testament quotes the New Testament. And the comparison between 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. Observing these realities allows one to maintain their belief in the promise of preservation without overstating the facts. Okay? This biblically revised position can still be maintained by faith in God's word without abandoning the fadistic believing approach to scripture. I believe, folks, that that is the answer. I believe that that is the solution. So, does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Right. Well, for me, when I first started uh, seeing this, um, take First Corinthians one eighteen, and if you were to approach that from a variant reading from the King James Bible to any of the modern translations, most of them, uh, so I've gone through them all, but the modern <coughs> translations will say being saved. So that's very greedy, but what does that do? That completely changes the meaning. Of that is a substantive alteration of the doctrinal content of that verse. Does it mean the same thing? Doesn't mean the same thing. 
So what I'm saying is, is the, is the Word of God have a certain amount of flexibility? It is not bound up. Okay? Now, let me just say, where some King James advocates take this whole idea so far that they will insist that only a certain printing in a certain year on a given press is the pure Word of God. And anybody with a King James Bible that isn't printed, that wasn't printed in that year on that press still has, does not have the pure Word of God. That's how far some are, are, are willing to take this insistence, okay? For me, as I've looked at that, I think that is going way too far. And then King James advocates then will argue about which is the perfect setting of the text. Well, no, this is the perfect setting. No, this is the perfect setting. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they are functioning under the assumption that it has to be verbatimly what? Identical. Exactly identical. Xeroxed identicality. Okay? So let me just read this last bit here. On page, I back, go back to page 6 in the notes. <clears throat> I understand that that chart is going to take some processing. Okay, especially if you're just seeing it for the first time to understand what I'm saying. Okay, I'm understand. Here's what I'm saying. I believe in preservation because the scripture teaches me to believe in preservation. I functioned for a long time that with the, with the understanding that what that meant was that things had to be exactly what? Xeroxed identicality. When I realized that that wasn't the case within the printed tradition of the King James Bible, this caused me nights and nights and nights of, of, of no sleep because it just completely rocked my world and rattled my cage because it was contrary to what I had always been taught by the great sages of the King James only movement. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to be demeaning to anybody. I'm just saying... And what, so I realize that what I have to do is I have a choice to make. I can leave my belief in preservation and adopt a different way of looking at it. Or what I can do is I can look back to the scriptures that taught me to believe in preservation in the first place and let them teach me how to think about the secondary issue now of how to think about textual variants. Okay. So I perceive that the position that I'm arguing for is a completely faith-based position, thinking through the secondary issues based upon the Word of God also. So, middle of page 6. According to our biblically adjusted view of preservation, see the chart at the link above, that's that chart right there. The terms <clears throat> pure and perfect do not demand exact identicality of wording but simply substantively equivalent meaning. Okay? I have no problem speaking about pure or perfect preservation if by perfect one means the following. The existence of a pure text that does not report information about God, His nature or character, His doctrine, His dispensational dealings with mankind, History, archaeology, or science that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve His word assumes, or excuse me, God's promise to preserve His word assures the existence of a text that has not been altered in its character or doctrinal content despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. Okay? Now, I think we're going to have to stop there and make this a two-parter because I'm not done. But I just should say, does anybody have any questions or comments? Is everybody understanding what I'm trying to get across in this? I firmly believe that this is the answer. This is the missing piece in the whole debate about the transmission and preservation and the text and the translational debates that are going on. I'm not claiming any sort of special knowledge or revelation. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying that as I've thought through this and try to think about it in a way that's in line both with the Word of God and with the facts as they are on the ground, 
This to me is the most plausible scriptural solution to the, to the situation. Okay, so anybody have any questions or comments? Or you don't understand something? Greg? One more thing on 1 Corinthians uh, one eighteen. For me, what I... What the modern translations are doing when they change that, uh, going all the way back to, uh, you know, the... The readings that Westcott and Hort were working on, they're changing that. They're changing the meaning of that verse. So if I'm new to the faith, if, if I've just been saved and I'm going through the scriptures and I come to something that's saying that I'm saved, that I'm sealed, and then I'm coming to another verse that says that I'm in being saved. that you're in process. Yeah, and then there's you know the, the, the there's doctrines you know primarily from like the Roman Catholic Church that say we can never really know if we're saved. We're in the process of being saved. And only if you, you know, you get to the end of your life, maybe if you've done all this, you're lucky enough to go to heaven. That's only going to cast doubt in my mind if I'm being fed milk. You know, when the Word of God wants us to get to the point where, we, where we're being fed meat. Right. So, what I have here, I'll just end with this. This is uh, John Owen. <clears throat> in, in, uh, in 1652, Brian Walton, a guy, a, a, a Anglican bishop named Brian Walton, published a polyglot of the New Testament text that contained 30,000 variant readings in the, in the footnotes on this, on this text. Okay, This guy, John Owen is writing this in the 1650s. It's called An Integrity on the Purity of the Hebrew and Greek Text of the Scripture. And he's responding to Brian Walton in the publication of his polyglot. This is what he says about variant readings. He says, quote, The providence of God in taking care of His word, which He hath magnified above His name, as the most glorious product of His wisdom and goodness, His great concernment in this word, answering like uh, answering his promise to this purpose. The religious care of the church, I speak not of the Romanish synagogue to whom these oracles of God were committed. The care of the first writings is given unto the authentic, is given, is give, let me start over. The care of the first writings in giving out authentic copies of which they had received from God unto many, <clears throat> which might be rules to the first transcribers the multiplying of copies to such a number as it was impossible any should corrupt them all willfully or by negligence. Here's a guy in the 1650s that is in a dead struggle to the death with Roman Catholics over the issue of Sola Scriptura in the 1650s, acknowledging that number one, yes, there are variant readings, and number two, God still did what? preserved his word even though he's aware of the fact that there are what variants. variant readings now he's not explaining it quite the same way that i am in this lesson okay in fact if i read this i think i've summarized all this down to something that's a little bit more gettable okay but i'm just pointing this out as a historical example of somebody in the 1650s who is acknowledging number one the existence of variant readings and number two, also acknowledging that God promised to preserve his word and that that was done through a multiplying of what? Copies. Not by trying to reconstruct the original based upon the oldest witness, but by looking at all these copies that are available to the body of Christ and saying, here's, here's what we should look at as being preserved, not these few found dead on the side of the road manuscripts that were never used in church history by anybody. Okay? But we got to quit. It's five after... So we will continue with these notes um, next week, so make sure you bring them back, okay? Thanks.